Hey there. Today I'm so excited to have my friend and colleague Mark Pittman here with me. And he is the CEO of the Concord Leadership Group, and we're going to be talking about leadership. So welcome, Mark. Thanks. It's so good to be here. And I love um, the topic, obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Mark has recently engaged in a formal research project on leadership styles and culture of philanthropy. So I'm going to let him get started and just tell us a little bit about the research and, and what he found. Well, thank you. Yeah, two years ago, we did a research project to look at uh, leadership systems in nonprofits. And so this re revisited that. But it also, um, we, we looked at, Adrian Sargent wanted to tie it to leadership styles as well. So servant leadership, transformational leadership, charismatic leadership, and transactional leadership were the four, four styles that were in the, in the uh, academic literature. Um, he didn't just... want to put servant leadership in there, uh, <laughs> but I said we really need to, and I'm glad we did. Mark, just for anybody who doesn't know who Adrian Sargent is, you know, we've both worked with him. He's probably the leading academic researcher in the field of philanthropy and fundraising. So I just wanted to throw that in. Um, so if you don't know who Adrian Sargent is, go ahead and look him up and you can read tons, tons of his publications. But um, so when you say you did research with him, it adds a lot of weight. But I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that. Thank you. I do appreciate that because I forget that I know he's world class and uh, helping nonprofits, especially taking the big research and making it applicable to smaller nonprofits that uh, most of our nonprofits are smaller. So I love yeah. that he's, he's doing that. That's really good. Yeah. So, so you looked at leadership styles. What did you find? And what we tied them to was the behavior. So we looked at what are your leadership behaviors and how, how, how do you reflect, you know, how do you seem to respond in leadership? Uh, situations and then where he correlated those with the outcomes of are is your budget growing do you have a culture of philanthropy at your organization and that sort of thing um, wow. and we found that uh, well over half the people had behaviors that were tied to servant leadership which mm -hmm. makes sense in nonprofits you serve others you lift others up um, and and so that is it's kind of it's cool that that was the predominant model um, we also found that that was the best for uh, fundraising mm -hmm. uh, that was created a culture when people, apparently we have to do more research, but the people that had exhibited servant leadership styles of helping their nurturing the people around them, they mm -hmm. also seem to share the load with it came to, comes to fundraising. Uh, transformational leadership, which is the kind of, we, we have a common vision and a common mission and we're gonna lead with that. We're gonna rally around the mission, uh, was now about 35%. Okay. And the people responded that way, whereas over 50% of the people responded to servant leadership, 35 to transformational. And that had a very high correlation with the leader being able to create a culture of philanthropy and the board taking ownership of that as well, okay. um, which is, is interesting. Uh, where it fell apart was when the leader didn't feel confident. Mm. And the leader felt like, and there's a lot of us that go through leadership, our leadership journeys often go through weight dips in confidence. Um, and so when the leader wasn't getting educated in fundraising, it wasn't sure, the, the board didn't seem to take on. But when the leader felt like there, there was a knowledge of fundraising, there seemed to be a culture of philanthropy that would also be taken. So let me ask you a question. So first of all, how does somebody know what their leadership style is? And can they do anything about it to change it, to increase the culture of philanthropy? Great questions, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, you may I mean, not have the answers to these. I don't know. Well, so that, it's funny you should say that because I'm in the process right now of trying to create an assessment based off of the questions in here so okay. that we can just have some sort of some um, uh, uh, tool to say this. I tend to be more, we're all a mix of, every, of I think, all four of them. Uh, right. But it's, I, I keep looking down because I've got them right here, uh, the, the pie chart. Um, okay, good. And listen, how can people get that? If oh, they, everybody can have this pie chart if they want. Uh, <laughs> go to conqueredleadershipgroup.com slash report, and uh, you can download the entire report, uh, which okay. talks we'll, about the We'll have that link below. Planning too. So the other two forms of care, some people are going to be driven a little batty, but there are four types of leadership. So quickly, the other two are uh, at 29% was charismatic leadership, which tends to be around the person. We see this a lot in nonprofits uh, where the boards are like, oh, we got the right person in the place and we don't have to really worry about what they do. 
Um, they tend to drive fundraising, but they don't tend to bring anybody along in growing the fundraising. They tend to do the fundraising all themselves, okay. uh, according to this, this particular study. And then the last one was transactional leadership, which is uh, only 5% of the people said that they had those kind of tendencies. But the transactional is sort of, if you ever find yourself saying, I pay you to do a job, just do your job. <laughs> that tends to be much more transactional. And uh, yeah. interesting correlation with that is people that said they were declining and their budgets were declining mm -hmm. on a downward slide, also highly correlated with transactional leadership. Interesting. So, so it's one time. One to avoid those, right? Well, we don't know. We don't, we can't say that it's causal. So, but oh, it can be, oh. a, it can be a trigger. It can oh. be something where you're able to say, right. I'm starting to really worry about people's job descriptions and getting stuff done. Um, okay. maybe, maybe I'm in crisis or maybe that leads to crisis. Um, right. I think as leaders, we all have to go, look, there's a job. <laughs> we need to hire people that will do their job, but we also have to remind people there is a job to do. <laughs> so, right. um, but yeah, focusing so, on the job description could be the problem as opposed to focusing on the vision. Probably. Right. Okay. So what are some of the most important takeaways from this study that you did? What, you know, what should organizations know, do, what, what can they, um, what can they take away? Well, I think the biggest things that the most of the rest of the report are good project systems, good systems to have in leadership. We looked at strategic planning and it looked like it was a slight uptick in number of people that were doing strategic planning versus previous years. But then we looked at all of the indicators of good strategic plans. Like you included your staff, you have a succession plan, you include fundraising, you do all this stuff. They were dismal to the point where Adrian and the, his research partner said that it was, it appeared that nobody in nonprofits was really actually thinking about planning in a, in a legitimate way. They were mm -hmm. just carbon, the car, kind of cutting and pasting somebody else's strategic plan into their own and putting their own organization name. It was just, mm -hmm. we have the talk of strategic right. planning. We don't yeah. have the process. So I think that's the takeaway is. Um, we talk it, the talk, but we don't walk the walk. Yeah. Um, I, and the first one, too, we, we indicated some of that. I, I called it strategic wishing. Mm -hmm. um, we have, we talk strategy. We, we wish it'll be this way, but we don't put the actual, we don't, I mean, one of the things that it seems like we don't do in this sector is even look at other organizations, other nonprofits to see what are they doing and can we collaborate or can we learn from or mm -hmm. are we just going to be good neighbors? We're on the same street, but we're, um, so I think, th I think there's a lot in the report that people can, can learn about, oh, I should be thinking about this in my nonprofit. Right. Um, the takeaway, I think the one thing that would, if any leader listening to this were able to do is just to think about who's going to take over my position when I leave. Yeah. Um, Succession planning. Yeah. And I didn't want to call it that initially, but you, oh. that's exactly, no, 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 that's totally what it is. <laughs> um, for me, it's, I, the way I say this, and it usually gets laughs at, at trainings, is that if your nonprofit is worth, worth the mission is worth doing for the generations to, or for decades to come, yeah. you need a succession plan. It's not a personal attack on the leader. You're not right. making any, you know, any, uh, you're not saying I want you fired. Um, yeah. You're just doing due diligence well, of what happens. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, you know, as if nobody's ever dropped dead before, right? And right. I mean, you know, you may not want to think that about your own mortality, but you get hit by a bus, you have a heart attack. And, you know, if you haven't done your succession planning, so let's say everybody loves you and wants you to stay around forever. It doesn't always happen. And it's just irresponsible not to plan for that type of thing. So I think that's a great example um, of thing, you know, something concrete that an organization can do. So, you know, just, just go over some really, really basics. What, what do they do for a succession plan? Well, so there's two ways. First of all, I want to just reinforce that even if it's not the organizational succession plan, mm -hmm. I believe leadership, I believe all of us have a leadership potential and leadership, an area of influence. So whatever, you know, positional influence we have or leadership title, we can still be looking who's going to, who could fill in my shoes. What are the job description? What are the, what are the requirements? Uh, what are, what's the characteristics? And then I'll laser focus us to make better hires and recruit better volunteers. Because yeah. we'll, well, it's that reticular activation. When you buy a red Prius, you start seeing them everywhere else. It's the same <laughs> thing with people. When you define who you are looking for, um, I don't know my friends calls it a missing persons description. When you clearly <laughs> define as clearly as you would a description of your kid that's missing, um, then you start seeing those people around. So um, yeah. I would take, I would love a board and a CEO to get together and just say what my uh, clients in the Northern New England call it a moose plan. 
Mm-hmm. You know, if you get hit by a moose or if you hit a moose, the odds of the human winning are really bad. Um, <laughs> so what would happen? What are the mission critical operations that have to keep going on? And what are the ones that could take a back burner? Yeah. Um, where do we find that stuff? Yeah. Um, yes, I know it's up in your head, CEO, with the strategic plan not in writing, but right. um, where can we, where will we find those things? Right. Um, and starting asking some of those questions may feel a little bit better than who do we replace you with? Because yeah. when you don't have a succession plan, you've seen this, I'm sure, nonprofits tend to swing the pendulum. They have the really outgoing, charismatic person who doesn't pay attention to detail at all, and mm-hmm. then they get tired of that person, so they go for the detail person that, they, that is so, such a stickler for detail that they can't really communicate well with people, and they wonder, how do we get stuck over here? And then they, get, they fire that person. Um, and, and if, so that reminds me, if any of your listeners or anybody listening to this need, as a CEO that needs a, a further impetus for why you should start doing any form of strategic planning is boards tend to be the most excited and two times in the, in the life of an organization, hiring and firing the CEO and doing a strategic plan. So if you yeah. like your job and you don't want to get fired, get them the other thing that they like, which is really getting them rallied around the mission and vision of the organization. And how are we going to impl- process this out? How are we going to you know, put this in, in implement this? Yeah. And, for good or for worse, most boards aren't going to do this for you. Um, you're going to need to shepherd this. Um, yeah. I tend to see that as a glass is half full. Um, mm-hmm. It would be wonderful if boards were able to, but most of us are expertise in our cause where the boards are expertise in other things. And so influencing the strategic plan is something that are better at. Interesting. Yeah. So just a final word on the, on the uh, yeah. succession planning, and then I'm going to ask you for your final words. But, you know, just some basics like, uh, figuring out who or how to name the interim, you know, when something like that happens. Uh, you said, you know, having that job description and knowing where you're going to post it and who on the board is responsible for, you know, doing that hire. So is there a committee? Um, and, and that's sort of it. It doesn't have to be long or complicated or difficult, but what's going to happen, uh, you know, and, and how, what's the process for, for the succession plan and, and re- being replaced, you know, being replaced. I know a CEO doesn't want to think about it, but, you know, who's going to do the interim work and then who on the board is responsible for, for launching that hiring process. Well, one of the other kind of dirty little secrets in our field that I think Compass Point study showed is that 50% of executive directors want to leave their job. So so this could be a get out of jail free card too. Um, One way that a very practical way that Living Room Atlanta did it, um, talked about in our last report was um, the CEO brought in the next person that was actually, they were both neck and neck for the job and just had her started sitting in on all the meetings. And every decision he made, he would brief her, kind of bring her into speed first. What do you think we should do? And then he would make his own decision, but he'd also educate her about why he made the decision, what he was seeing from his position, mm-hmm. um, and whether he, they agreed or not. They, they were able to do that. When he died on a, really tragically, uh, their organization was allowed to mourn because mm-hmm. every, all the operations were like, there were two people he'd actually brought in. The right. humility to bring somebody into those meetings that's usually only you is... Yeah. is it's striking in a leader, but I think it could be a really smart way to just start baby stepping toward a succession plan. Yeah. Interesting. All right, good. So final thoughts or uh, one more example of something you want to share? Well, I think the final thought of what I love about what Adrian's done here. And as people delve into this is the thinking about how we are as leaders, where do we tend to go? Do we tend to rally people around ourselves, around a job description, around a vision? Um, and each of the leadership styles has a shadow. So the servant leader is really good at helping other people grow in their purpose and their and all, but they may resist based on the bad strategic planning that's happening. It may be that the shadow is that they don't want to hold people accountable. And one of the best ways, so to everybody that's more servant leader, one of the best ways you can serve people is by holding them accountable, by saying, you commit to doing this. This was part of our goal and we didn't reach it. What, what are we doing to move forward? So yeah. um, I think looking at our behaviors and starting to just be interested, at least curious about how we, st- why we do things can help us grow phenomenally as leaders. As I think forward. that's an excellent, excellent final takeaway. So just one more time, where can people get the report? Thank you at conqueredleadershipgroup.com slash report. Excellent. We'll post it under this video. And I thank you so much for joining me, Mark. It's always fun to talk to you. It's a real privilege to be here. Thanks so much, Amy.